early Pentecostals. And from what I understand from reading on the internet, he started the church in 2001. Uh, they started the church, and now it's a thriving church. He's saying they're they're busting at the seams, and they're right. To, they're they're trying to figure out ways to come up with more room, putting people on the platform, uh, having children's services, and they're about to go to two services. And so we want him to. Uh, he's going to minister it to us tonight. And I know that sometimes what happens is uh, during the conference that. Uh, sometimes the saints, they, they feel all convicted because maybe they haven't been doing what they need to be doing. And so instead of praying through souls, we got to pray through the saints and get them right. And then we can focus on the souls. Well, guess what? Tonight is a leadership session. So tonight we're going to get fired up. We're going to get prayed through. Us ministers, pastors, altar workers, we're going to get fired up and prayed through. And tomorrow, guess what? We're not going to have to pray through again. We're going to bring the fire of God with us. So I'm excited about Pastor Jones coming and ministering to the leaders here in Athens. So Pastor Jones, if you come, preach to us the word of God. We're so glad, happy to have you. Praise the Lord, everybody. You know what I like is that in any language, in any country, you can sense hunger and thirst for God. It doesn't matter if you understand one another. When you see people thirsting and hungering for God it doesn't need to be translated and I love that and I feel that here, amen I'm here hungry tonight for spiritual food you're thirsty for that living water that only he can provide hallelujah but we want to give honor to the superintendent and bishop of grace Strickland and his beautiful wife. God bless you. We're so honored to be here with you tonight. Thank you for the invitation. Also, Missionary Moreno and his wife, who were wonderful hosts to us today. Thank you so much. Honored to be here. And uh, I want to thank the team from North Getty who uh, traveled and came to handle music and things. We love and appreciate all of you. I did not thank Brother Adams. Brother Adams now is our assistant pastor at Northgate. And because of his travels internationally, he's been able to launch a great vision for our home church to travel international. We hope we're just getting started. So would you give him a hand? If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 2. I'm going to read one verse there. Hebrews chapter 2. Amen. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death, he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. I want to preach to you for a few moments tonight the strategy of the kingdom. The strategy of the kingdom. What he looks to do first and foremost is to render powerless him, the prince and the power of the air, that had the power of death, that is the devil. His first priority is not to save you, but to depose the dictator who runs your life. Before he can take over as Lord, before he can sit on the throne of your life, there's someone else who's been deceiving you and stealing and killing from you and whispering in your ear that has to be deposed. And if we're going to have revival in the next few days, and if God is going to show up and show off, the first thing that has to happen in the kingdom is the real king has to take his throne and depose the one who tries to set up a false throne. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the spirit of God. We thank you for the people of God that are anointed and called. We pray tonight that everything that we do would uplift and exhort and encourage the leaders would draw them to a place and show them your strategy, your plan, oh God, 
for this weekend to cast down him who tries to take dominion where it's rightfully yours in our lives. God, we stand tonight and resist the enemy. Having done all the stand, we stand therefore, having our loins girt about with truth, putting on the whole armor of God, Lord. We resist him steadfast, Lord. We pray that your spirit would begin to depose the darkness and the light would begin to shine in this place. And the true king would set up his kingdom in Greece. Hallelujah. In Athens. In Thessaloniki. In Corinth, oh God. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. And everyone said amen. amen. Would you clap your hands for the Lord? Please be seated. Hallelujah. Is it warm in here or is it me? It could be me. It could be me. I love what Brother Moreno said about the word hallelujah. You know it's not in the Bible. Hallelujah is in the Bible. Yes. But ha hallelujah comes from a Hebrew word halal which means to rave about God. Matter of fact, David, when he was with the Philistine king Achish, the Bible said he feigned himself mad and the spittle ran down his feet. The Hebrew word is he feigned himself halal. In other words, he got so carried away praising God in the presence of a pagan king that they thought he was crazy. Because when you say halal, you can't say it like some people who say, hallelujah. It doesn't carry the context of the word. The word is to rave about God. It is to be mad about God. It is to be crazy about God. So, hallelujah. Praise God. He said that he came in the flesh, Jesus came in the flesh in Hebrews 2, that he might render him powerless, who had the power of death, that is the devil. That he might subdue, or that he might overcome and destroy his dominion. The word render powerless here is not used in the sense of killing, but in the sense of bringing him into subjection to the real king's authority and power. He said, you've had free reign long enough. Now my kingdom is coming. And it's time for you to be deposed. From the throne you usurp from Adam. Amen. And I'm coming and the first thing I'm going to do is take you off that throne and show everyone you're not as powerful as you seem to be. You may remember that when Jesus was tempted, that Satan took him up into a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the then known world. And he said... If you'll just worship me once, I'll give you all this because it's mine to give. Because Adam released it to me. It's mine to give. I've got the power and the dominion because of the choice of Adam. Amen? See, the strategy of the king of the kingdom, Jesus came for the express purpose to destroy the kingdom of Satan in this world and to set up another kingdom in its place. Amen? Amen? Satan understood this to be Jesus' objective. Because when he came to cast out demons, in Matthew 8, 29, they would cry out, What business do we have with each other, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before our time? They understood end time events. And they understood everything that Jesus would do in the fulfillment of the kingdom had not come to pass. And they said, why are you here early? Because some of the prophecies come to pass now and some later in the end time fulfillment of the kingdom of God. And they knew ultimately we're getting destroyed. But why are you here now? Jesus went straight to the spiritual source of sickness, possession, and death. Because the wages of sin is death. Sin was Satan's idea in the garden. Once sin happened, then sickness and death could follow. 
He introduced the ideal that disobedience to God led to equality with God. That was his ideal to introduce that. Death was a part of his dominion because sin always leads to death. Now understand, I'm not saying that your particular sins, but sin in general. You understand that? Sin in general always leads, we all die of something. Amen? And Jesus came to overcome death. Just as David caught the head of Goliath with the giant's own sword, Jesus uses Satan's power against him when Satan gives the wages of sin to a man who never sinned. That's when he forfeited his power and his power over death because he gave him the sentence that sin demanded, but Jesus had never sinned. That's when he took his own sword and said, hey, I never sinned. I was tempted in all points, such as man, yet without sin. But when you killed me, then you gave me back the sword that you got from Adam. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. 1 Corinthians 15, 25, 26 says, For he must reign until he's put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be abolished is death. Amen? That's the last enemy that's going to be abolished. You are going to live forever. Amen? You are going to be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And the last enemy that we all face that has terrified us all before we came to Christ is death. Amen. Death is called the last enemy because it entered the world after the devil and sin entered. For Satan brought in sin and sin brought forth death. And notice the order of Jesus' conquest. First, he conquered Satan in his temptation and continu continued to destroy the works of Satan in sickness and possession in his ministry. Then he conquered sin through his death on the cross. And lastly, he destroys death in his resurrection. It's important that you understand that order. Just in the same way that they came into the world, Jesus starts there first at the temptation. Amen. Then he casts out demons. Then he heals the sick that is a consequence of the first sin, the fall of man. And then in his resurrection, he destroys death. Hell and the grave. Amen. I love Genesis 3.15. After the fall. The curse. God says I will put enmity. Between you and the woman. And between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head. You shall bruise him on the heel. Some translations say he shall crush your head. You will bruise his heel. That enmity, yes, was speaking of the seed, Jesus. But there ought to be enmity between the blood-bought saints of God and Satan as well. If you don't love God enough to win a soul, you ought to hate Satan enough to win a soul. Praise God. If loving God is not motivation enough to get you to speak out and speak up, what Satan did with your life before Jesus got a hold of it ought to be motivation enough, praise God, to pray and to intercede and to go and to share. Notice the earliest prophecy of the future Messiah, that the objective of the promised seed is to crush Satan's head. It doesn't mean literally. He's talking about dominion and headship. He's not talking about the snake. He's talking about the power and the dominion. He's going to destroy his dominion. Christ's priority is not to save us, but to subdue the one, amen, who has power over us. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, that the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ. He has power. Amen. He blinds. He deceives. But we're not ignorant of his devices. But Jesus Christ comes. Amen. To destroy his dominion and his power. Hallelujah. The one who binds us through lies and deception. First, he does this by proving that we've been serving a tyrant and an inferior king. 
Hallelujah. He said, well, you got them sick with sin, I'll heal them. You're able to take dominion and control of their body through possession. I'll cast you out. What he's trying to show is that the power of the kingdom is greater than the power of the prince and the power of the air. See, that's why Jesus and his disciples preached the gospel of the kingdom, never the gospel of salvation. You never see the gospel of salvation. That's a modern concept. It was always the gospel of the kingdom. It was the announcement of a king and it was a demonstration of the king's power and dominion over the prince and the power of the air. I'm here to tell you that if Holy Ghost filled people would stop trying to get people saved and start preaching the gospel of the kingdom, the power and the demonstration of the kingdom would return. Salvation will happen when the kingdom comes. Because the king is going to take up residence. And he's going to take authority over the enemy in your life. And he's going to kick him out. Hallelujah. See, they announced a king and they demonstrated a superior power over the God of this world. See, we made salvation a destination. We made it the finish line. If I read my Bible right, it's the birth. It's the beginning. I'm glad you have the Holy Ghost. I'm glad you've spoken in tongues. I'm glad that you've been baptized in Jesus' name. But you're just getting started. Right. That's right. It's a wonderful thing. We celebrate every step with every person. The Bible says the angels rejoice when one sinner repents. We rejoice. But that's not the finish line. That's why they preach the gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel of salvation. See, if the kingdom were a castle, salvation would be the drawbridge. Make sense? If the kingdom is a highway, salvation is an on-ramp. Well, let, me, let me do one that you'll understand. If the kingdom is the subway, then the metro station is salvation. Got it? You're just getting in. You're just getting started. We're glad you're here. We celebrate the progress, but you haven't done nothing yet because the king has to take it full of Progress process for me. I'll just be honest with you. Uh, I came from a very rough background, and I had some very distasteful language in my life. And that didn't just leave immediately. I could cuss you in rhyme. You know what I'm saying? That didn't just. I didn't just get over that in a few weeks or months. Right? But that hadn't happened in years because the king started taking dominion over areas of my life. And my speech started changing and my thoughts started changing when I hit my, my hand with a hammer. Something else came out. You know? But we, we in American culture, especially American Christianity, have made salvation the destination. You just get started. You're not even sanctified yet. And he was set apart in areas. The dominion of the king has to take a full hold in every life. Amen. See, that's, that's the deal. The gospel is not about saying yes and getting in. It's about being a part of a certain kind of culture that is created by people living out kingdom principles. Amen. As we live out the principles, as the king takes dominion in my life, you start to see more of his power and more of his authority, amen, and more of his likeness and more of his resemblance, praise God. And the more I resemble him, the more my results are like him. If you don't resemble him, you'll never have his results. I don't care how much you speak in tongues. <laughs> you understand that? I mean, if you've been here for a while, you ought to start acting like the king. Amen. You understand you're not perfect. I'm not either. But you ought to start resembling the king. He takes that personally when you want his salvation and forgiveness, but you don't want to look like the king. Right. Is this all right? Am I okay? Is that all right? You know what I'm saying? 
a lot of folks are like, yeah, I'm forgiven and I'm saved. And I was like, your language is horrible. Man, it's an American. I hear y'all are good Christians. You're not the real deal. This is back there, you know. And then we all have these little blind spots, you know, where we just haven't let God be Lord. We really haven't. I was preaching to my church a few years ago, and I had them going. I knew where I was taking. I was like, yeah, I was preaching about the New Jerusalem, and it's a. The New Jerusalem is a 15 mile by 15 mile by 15 mile cube. It's a remake of the Holy of Holies. You know that, right? And only holy people are going in there. Not any dogs, not any, not, not any things that defile are going in there. You understand that? So I was preaching along and I had them right where I wanted them. I said, just tell me when the high point of the holiness movement was. Was it the 1950s? I knew what they would say. They were like, yeah, it was the 1950s. I said, you want to go back to the race relationship we had in the 1950s? Nobody preached about that? Huh? <laughs> oh, it got quiet in here too. <laughs> See, we all got these blind spots where he's not the king. But we sing and we praise God, but he hadn't changed our heart about that stuff. I tell my church, hey, if you hadn't changed your heart about people of different cultures and people of different race, you need some sanctification to go on in your life. Amen? Because my Bible tells me there's neither Jew nor Greek, bottom nor free, male nor female, but need the cross. Hallelujah. It's not a caste system. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. See, that's why Jesus' disciples preached the gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel of salvation. See, salvation then becomes how we engage the present reality of the kingdom. The gospel is an invitation to live within a new context, new principles, new way of living. That's what the gospel is an invitation in to live under the power and dominion of a king. Do you know how I know? We don't realize we've entered a kingdom. Because when you enter a kingdom, you become subjects. We think we're citizens and we have rights. Just because you get to vote in Greece don't mean you get to vote in the kingdom. <laughs> I didn't get any of that from that. This goes over better in America. You know, they're big on voting and rights and citizenship and all that stuff. Uh, yeah. You have no rights. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Amen. When the king decrees, you obey. It's not open for debate. Praise God. It's not a discussion. That's how I know we don't, we don't think we've come into a kingdom. Because we bring the concepts of rule and authority from democracy in and think, I don't like that. Too bad. <laughs> The king said it. Amen. Amen. He has absolute authority in his kingdom. That's not how we view salvation. We think once we're saved, we become citizens with rights and the right to vote. And when the king makes demands of self-denial and carrying our cross, many of us vote, no thank you. All right? When the work of the kingdom conflicts with our hobbies, we vote no with our attendance. Amen. Nobody wants to say amen. You can say amen. That's all right. Should we say amen? Amen. No. Right? When the demands of the kingdom are inconvenient, we vote no. We often tell our king we're too tired for kingdom priorities. Thank God that convenience, weariness, and torture didn't turn Jesus from the cross. Thank God that the king didn't say, hey, this is too hard. I don't think I can make it all the way to the cross. But the Bible says for the joy that was set before him, he endured the shame, despised it. Hallelujah. The cross. Thank God that convenience didn't come into his question mark. The Bible says in Matthew 4.23, Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, 
teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. Anytime the kingdom goes forth, there's healing and there's miracles and there's signs and there's wonders. Amen? That's the demonstration of the king's power and authority. He said in Luke 10, 8, when you enter a town and are welcome, eat what is offered you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them when you heal them the kingdom of God is coming. Isn't that different from the way it happens for us? Somebody has a healing meeting and then he goes and has another healing meeting and says, so-and-so is here. No, the kingdom is here. <laughs> the king and his kingdom has the power to heal. Praise God. And when we announce the king and his kingdom, his power will flow through us. Amen. We are ambassadors of the king. And I'm just a representative of the king telling people he is here. Ready to heal. Ready to deliver. Amen. Amen. Brother Tyron and I, I don't know if you know his testimony, but we both share a drug background. We've both been delivered from drugs. I don't go to AA meetings. Because at AA meetings, the first thing you have to say is, Hi, I'm Brent. I'm, I'm an next drug alcoholic. I got delivered. Right. I've never had another desire. When I got a hold of the Holy Ghost, far better than any white powder you can put in your nose. Amen. When I got a hold of forgiveness, it was far more interesting to me than anything I'd experienced in the world. I don't go and tell people I'm still struggling. I'm done with that. I got delivered by a king who had more power than the king who tricked me into taking it. Hallelujah. Praise God. I love what he says here in Luke 10, 9 through 18. He says, Whatever city you enter, they do not receive you. Go out into the streets and say, Even the dust of your city which claims for our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I say to you, it will be more tolerable in the day of Sodom than for that city. That's a strong statement, isn't it? See, when people reject the gospel, they never reject you. They reject the king who sent you. Don't get, don't take it personally. Move on. Why? You know what Jesus was trying to tell them? Don't spend time with unresponsive people. There's somebody waiting. There's somebody hungry. There's somebody who's at the end of their rope. Don't spend time with people who want to argue and debate. Ah! Uh -uh. He said, wipe the dust off your feet and protest. He said, I'll handle them if they don't turn. Because you're my ambassador. And if they reject you, they're ultimately rejecting me. Don't take it personal. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, a lot of us go out and we do a little evangelism and we, it doesn't work well. We have a bad experience. We say, well, that's not my, that's not my gift. No, it's your gift. <laughs> you just spent too much time with some buzzsaw who took all your desire and zeal, right? I wanted to argue. I had a guy one time. I'm in another country. Maybe this won't go everywhere. <laughs> the guy has a pornography problem. He's addicted to pornography. And he wants to argue with me about the Godhead. <laughs> I'm like, you got your priorities out of whack, bud. We can sell that later. But right now your marriage is going down because you're addicted to something and there's a king in your life who's disposed whether there's three or one. It doesn't matter. None of them are in charge in your life. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to give you any. I know there's one, okay? I know there's one. Hallelujah. I know he's a man of God manifesting the flesh. It's all right. Well, sometimes people get on my nerves and I just have to get on their level, you know? But you meet people like that. I said, I'm not going to argue about the Godhead until you fix that. Fix that. Let the king come in and clean up your life. And then we'll talk about the Godhead. Hallelujah. Right? He said, Woe well, unto you, Chosarain. Woe well, unto you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had been performed in Tyre and Sodom, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. That's a hard statement. He said, if they would have seen the kingdom demonstrated as you see it, 
They have been on their face. But he said, you guys are hard-headed. He said, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sodom in the judgment than you. I want you to notice this principle. I'll read you another verse. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will be brought down to Hades. Understand this. The amount of judgment is always relative to the amount of light you get. The more of the kingdom you see, the more responsible you are. There's not a one judgment for everybody. You understand that? The more light you have, the more responsible. To him who's given much, the same is required much. If you've got the truth, if you've got the Holy Ghost, don't you sit on that. Don't you hide your light under a bushel. Hallelujah. Get out there and share it with somebody. Tell somebody about the gospel. Hallelujah. Be proud of the king and the kingdom you represent. Verse 16 of chapter 10 of Luke. Watch this. Here's what he says. The one who listens to you listens to me. And the one who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The 70 return with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to, you, to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. The kingdom of God was the central message in the Lord's ministry. The kingdom of God is the rule of God. His reign and His divine sovereignty in action in time and space. Okay? So anywhere you see the manifestation of healing and signs and miracles, that's God demonstrating I'm King here in this one location, in this time and space. Amen? Anytime you see somebody filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you need to say the kingdom of God is near. Amen? Hallelujah. Anytime you see somebody convicted of their sins and walk to an altar, the king has taken dominion in that life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, the miraculous point is to prove the presence of the king and his sovereignty. The power of the kingdom was present in the person and the work of the king, Jesus. The conditions of the kingdom were demonstrated to men by the removal of effects of sin, such as disease and death. The announcement of the kingdom was characterized by healing and casting out demons. Amen. I believe that you're going to see that in the next year. You're going to see more people healed than you've ever seen them before. Because as we race the rapture, the king and the birth pains of the fulfillment of the end time kingdom are going to come. And the power is going to be demonstrated. And men are going to walk in power and gifts of the spirit. And tongues and interpretation and prophetic utterance like never before. Because as we get closer to the fulfillment, you're going to see that return. You're going to see that return. God's going to raise up people who are going to be used in the gifts like you've not seen before. In uh, Matthew 12, 22, he said they brought to him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. Jesus healed him. So they, they could both he could both talk and see. And all the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It's only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that the fellow drives out demons. Hallelujah. Verse 25. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. In other words, Jesus said, that's dumb. Right. He said, you guys think you're smart. You're the Pharisees. You're the scribes. You know the Word of God. But that's dumb. That doesn't make sense. Irrational is what that is. It's irrational. So he goes on to say, if Satan drives out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, watch this verse. By whom do your people drive them out? You guys got some. You guys got some exorcists. Who are they driving them out by? Where does that power come from? If it can only come from Satan, Amen. But he said, if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Hallelujah. This is the demonstration, the announcement, and the power of the King when demons are driven out. Amen. 
And I'm not here to tell you God is going to anoint some people in this place. I prophesy to you right now. Some ministers right here to begin to cast out demons. Hallelujah. And power and demonstration. And when it happens, you tell them the kingdom has been revealed. And the demonstration of the king is upon you. Hallelujah. says in verse 29 or again I love this how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possession unless he first ties up the strong man then he can plunder his house right <laughs> he's giving them the explanation of what's going on he said I'm stronger than Satan I had to tie him up before I could take his stuff right now, you know, if Jesus tied him up, it didn't take anything for him but to speak, right? You read in the book of Revelation that one angel, one archangel named Michael, with one chain in one hand, ties up Satan and casts him in the bottom of his pit. One hand, one chain. Jesus comes along and he said, I just said, come out. I ain't got to put my hands on him. I ain't got to exert. He said, if you see that the kingdom of God know I'd happen by the finger of God. He said, I didn't use my hand. He said, I just put my pinky out there. He said, I just put my little finger on it. I'm here to tell you, you have more resurrection power and anointing in your life because of the Holy Ghost than all the powers of hell. Amen. of Satan and principalities, powers and rulers of darkness. Hallelujah. Amen. You remember that story? This is not my nose, but I feel like the Holy Ghost. Help me I'm going along, Gina. And he looks at your watch and it's good. I'm looking. It's my wife. She's my timekeeper. She knows when your seat can't endure what I can preach. Amen. I love her. appreciate her. Um, remember the guy that was a rich man who wound up in hell and he sees Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham he says have him dip his hand in water his finger in water and pour it on my tongue so I'm in torment here remember that? notice he didn't ask to get out no you come here and the Lord says not possible Right? Abraham says, not possible. This is a great God. Why couldn't he give him one drop of water? Because over there, that's living water. One drop of water from that place would have quenched every fire in hell. You understand that? That's how powerful that kingdom is. That's how powerful that water is. Amen? He said, I can't even let a drop cross over the gap because it'll put out every fire in hell. And what I'm trying to get the church to understand and the leaders is my God, if you're full of the Holy Ghost, step out and lay hands on somebody. Speak it. Declare it. Claim it. Be healed in Jesus' name. The kingdom has come unto you. Lay hands on them till they speak in tongues. Hallelujah. Lay hands on them till they're delivered of drugs and addiction. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Mm. The gospel of the kingdom is that God is now acting among men to deliver them from the bondage of sin. God is attacking the kingdom of Satan where it is obvious and where his rule and sway are dominating people. Exorcism is proof that the reign and the authority of God has come among men. Casting out demons is a work of the kingdom. It was evidence of the kingdom. See in Matthew where he says, how can, how can you take the strong man's stuff until you buy the strong man? Satan is the strong man. His house is the world. And his goods are possessed people. Are lost people. What he was trying to tell them was, doesn't my casting out of demons prove that I've subdued Satan? Just as it is necessary to buy the strong man before plundering his house? See, the demoniac is the captive of Satan. In seeking to cure him, Jesus shows, I'm Satan's enemy. In delivering him, Jesus said, I'm Satan's master. 
I'm his master. And when I say let go, he has to let go. Amen. When I told him about Job, you can take all this stuff, but don't touch his body. He couldn't go past that. Right. Notice that, that in that book of Job, when he said all the sons of God appear before God, Satan didn't have a choice. He was called. Come here, son. See, Satan still serves God. He thinks he's working against him, but God only gives him enough power to give the very opposite of what he thinks he's going to get. What he say he was going to get with Job? He's going to curse you. What he get? Worship. That's what he thinks about you. If I, if I put enough pressure on you, you'll quit. You'll back off. You'll stop worshiping. You'll suck your thumb. And every time you walk into church and lift your hands, you say, oh, no. All it does is make me want to worship you. Because he's giving me another endurance for today. And I made it through. And I'm not quitting now. Because I've come too far. Mm, let me land this plane. See if I can land it. In Matthew 12 and 30, it says, Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. All who do not aid or rejoice in the kingdom are against the kingdom. The authority of the king and the kingdom were evident among them in healing and exorcisms. God pronounced fearful judgment because rejection of the ambassador of the king is a rejection of the king. So, if you're a leader, be an ambassador. Represent him. Yes. Represent him in your speech. Represent him when you sing. Represent him when you come into trials and tribulation. Amen? And give a praise anyway. You're his ambassador. You're his representative. He's committed the kingdom into your hands and the message into your hands. He loves you. He trusts you. He knows you're able. He knows you can do it. Amen. He's given you the Holy Ghost. You can do it. You can do it. You can turn Athens upside down. I was talking to Brother Moreno today and he gave me some statistics. He told me still the most people in Athens are still part of the Greek Orthodox Church and understand. I'm here to tell you, you have something they want. They may not know it yet, but you have something they want and they're hungry for. And you just live it in front of them. Love them. Show them the power of the kingdom. Amen? Hallelujah. You have something they need. You have something they're hungry for. I know they may put on a strong face and they may not let you in at first, but if you keep loving them, and you keep reaching to them. And you be their friend regardless if they accept the gospel. Eventually, they're going to see the power of the demonstration of the kingdom. Hallelujah. I love what he says. You know, they came back. He said, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he says, rejoice not that the demons are subject to you. But that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. He said, I saw Satan fall as life. Many people read that verse and think that Jesus is referring back to the beginning fall. He's not. He said, as you were announcing the kingdom and preaching the kingdom and casting out demons and healing the sick, he said, I saw Satan's image. Satan's, the way he looked in people's eyes, I saw it falling. His sway over them. His power, how they understood him. It was falling. He's not talking about the original fall. As you preach. As you went, as people got delivered, I saw their view of him fall, praise God. They understood a greater king had come and a greater power had been demonstrated. Hallelujah. Hebrews 6, 5 said they taste to do the good word of God and the power of the age to come. See, some things were fulfilled there for Jesus. Some things were glimpses of the end time kingdom. See, the ultimate power of the Messiah's millennial reign penetrated into the present age. He said they tasted of the ages to come. A taste is real, isn't it? It's an experience, right? It's more than a promise. It's a realization. It's a miraculous experience. See, the miraculous point of the reality of the kingdom is to give glimpses or a foretaste of future kingdom conditions. See, healing... You might be healed of something 
And you might get sick of something else later, right? So it's not eternal. But what he was showing in the healing is healing was a glimpse of the ultimate healing described in heaven where there's no more sickness. Yeah. It was just a glimpse, a foretaste. He said, this isn't everything, but there is a place where there's no sickness and there's no night and there's no party. Hallelujah. I'm just giving you a glimpse of what's possible for eternity. Amen. Raising, raising the dead is a glimpse of the end time resurrection where the dead in Christ shall rise. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught together with them in the air. It's just a glimpse. Lazarus was a foretaste of the ultimate resurrection. I'm not going to die. If you read in the paper that Brother Jones died of cancer, don't believe that. Don't believe that. That might be the physical God cause, but God was done with me. And he took me home. Amen. Cancer didn't take me. The Bible says of Lazarus, the rich man was buried, but Lazarus was carried by the angels. That's where I'm going. Wow. Hallelujah. I believe that. I didn't die of cancer. I hope that doesn't happen, praise God. <laughs> <laughs> Casting out demons is a foretaste of when Satan will be finally bound and cast into the lake of fire. It was just a glimpse. He said, I'm going to show you a few glimpses of what it's going to be like when I set up my final kingdom. Yeah. And the king of kings rules. And Ryan, stand with me all over the board, please. I had a real good time preaching. I hope you were okay with listening. I just want to open your eyes a little bit. I'm going to open your eyes and give you a revelation about the king. I read a book recently. It changed my life. It wasn't really a religious book. It's by a guy named Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek has a book called Start With Why. I never asked that question. So I started asking God, why me? Why preach? Why call me into the kingdom? What's my why that you put in me that's distinct from you? He said, your why is to propagate kingdom culture. Not castle culture, kingdom culture. There's one king. That's your why. To propagate kingdom culture. See, I've been dealing with a young man and an anointing that God has been on me to speak really forcefully and frankly with him. He's kind of caught up in some other thoughts and movements in the head of his mind. I took him to the book of Ezekiel. You'll read Ezekiel 8 through 11. God takes Ezekiel 2 back to Israel. And he shows them that they've set up these idolatry. And they start out by the gate and they get closer to get into the temple and the walls. And, and if you'll watch by chapter 11, the presence of God is outside the city. He's still was over the temple for a while. What I was trying to tell this young man is, look, you can't have worship and live in an unsanctified state without him being Lord and King in your life. Very longer, he'll move away. He's very patient. He's very loving. He doesn't want to do that. But if we if we do that long term and we bring our idols in and we try to have this joint kingdom with him eventually, the king says, no, nah, I'm not being honored here. I'm not being treated as the rule and the authority of this place. And I told him, I said, you have a background with the Holy Ghost and you may be able to function in that environment, but your children will never know the other environment. They'll never know the move of the Holy Ghost. You need to be careful about your kids. Ira 
Oh 